On the final day of June 2009, a wearisome odyssey concluded. At last, a much-anticipated tranquility enveloped the Shafia family. Sadly, this was merely a facade. The following day, word of a horrific incident involving numerous individuals swept across the city. Kingston, a Canadian city situated on the northeastern shore of Lake Ontario, was designated the inaugural capital of a unified Canada in 1841. Presently, Canada is home to 58 federal penitentiaries, with nine situated in Kingston. During the summer of 2009, an event that was initially perceived as a tragic mishap took place in Kingston. Four individuals, three adolescents and one adult, were discovered deceased in a vehicle submerged in water north of the city's locks. Yet, it wasn't long before law enforcement unearthed the truth. It was not an accident. Mohammed Shafia was born to a middle-class family in Kabul during the early 1950s. Lacking formal education, he left school before finishing the seventh grade. Despite this, he diligently worked his way up, eventually becoming a successful entrepreneur who transformed an electronics shop into a lucrative import-export venture. In 1979, Shafia wed his first wife, Rona, a retired army colonel's daughter. Rona maintained a journal recounting her initial encounter with her husband and the subsequent years of maltreatment. The diary entries depict her life's progressive decline post-marriage. Regrettably, Rona's inability to conceive was a significant blow, leading the couple to spend seven years seeking infertility treatments in India, none of which bore fruit. Their marriage continued to sour. Shafia escalated his mistreatment of Rona, engaging in relentless criticism. He barred her from visiting her mother, disparaged her culinary talents, and berated her domestic management. Overwhelmed, Rona proposed the idea of a second wife. Polygamy, being permissible in Afghanistan, led to Shafia marrying a 17-year-old named Tuoba in 1988. Shortly after their marriage, Tuba became expectant, and by September 1989, they welcomed Zainab. Rona transitioned into a support role, aiding Tuba with the newborn and household chores, all while clinging to the hope of bearing her own child. The dynamic between Shafia's wives was strained from the outset, further complicated by the arrival of more children. Rona endured ongoing derision and, more grievously, physical violence from Shafia. She chronicled in her diary how her life had been reduced to suffering. Amid the turmoil in Afghanistan, the Shafia family sought refuge in Pakistan before relocating to the United Arab Emirates. There, Muhammad established a new venture, leading to renewed business success. In Dubai, the Shafia children were introduced to Western culture for the first time. Despite the UAE's Islamic foundations, they attended a private American school, donning uniforms, mastering English, and interacting with peers globally. By 2007, Having traversed much of the globe and resided in five distinct nations, Muhammad's affluence enabled him to participate in an investor migrant scheme in Canada, investing $2 million in a commercial complex and $200,000 in land for a family residence. The challenge arose from polygamy's conflict with Canadian law, potentially jeopardizing the agreements. Thus, Tuba was officially recognized as his wife, whereas Rona was later deemed Muhammad's cousin, purportedly arriving to serve as a nanny for the seven children and assist with domestic tasks. Upon settling in Montreal, a city celebrated for its cosmopolitan and liberal ethos, Rona harbored aspirations for an improved existence. Yet, domestically, the most stringent Afghan customs prevailed. The Shafia women endured a life of confinement devoid of autonomy. Muhammad initiated an import-export business specializing in apparel, domestic items, and construction materials. Adapting to Montreal's environment proved challenging. The children, accustomed to English education in Dubai, were now enrolled in a French language school. While Rona was fluent in French, her skills were largely overlooked, leaving her marginalized. Neither Mohammed nor Tuba spoke English or French, positioning the children as their interpreters. Awaiting their mansion's completion, the Shafias resided in a leased home, segmented into four bedrooms and two baths for two years, 
mostly leaving their furnishings from Dubai unpacked. Contrary to the lifestyle one might expect of an international businessman, the children slept on brown mats on the floor, underscoring a stark contrast to their previous life. Between 2007 and 2009, Mohammed primarily resided in Dubai instead of Montreal. Altogether, his time in Canada amounted to merely six months. Throughout these frequent international business journeys, his offspring Hamid assumed leadership within the household. Prior to relocating to Canada, Muhammad had set a principle that mandated educational achievement before any meetings. The eldest sibling kept a vigilant eye on his sisters, despite experiencing considerable liberty himself. Zainab and her younger sibling Sahar were fond of Western styles and took pleasure in mingling and interacting with fellow high school peers, which inevitably sparked severe turmoil within the family. Shafia, despite Zainab being the eldest, found herself concealing aspects of her life from her younger brother, even though they both were enrolled in the same school in Montreal. In February 2008, Zainab, then 18, captured the interest of Omar Wahid, a young Pakistani man, who expressed his affection by sending her a Valentine's Day card suggesting friendship. In a gesture of acceptance, he requested Zainab wear a white dress the following day. Zainab responded with a covert email, outlining the terms of their friendship and urging him to be mindful of her brother and to keep their association hidden from nosy observers. Their rare encounters, mainly in the library, were kept discreet. Zainab warned Omar of the dire consequences if her father discovered their rendezvous, fearing for her life at home. On an occasion when Zainab's parents were away in Dubai and her brother Hamid was at school, she seized the opportunity to have Omar visit. Rona was the only one at home, yet somehow Hamid learned of the visit. Upon discovering the concealed guest in the garage, he cordially shook his hand but requested he depart. He subsequently imposed a lockdown on Zainab, prohibiting her from exiting the home even for school until their parents return. Zainab endured the following ten months, isolated in her room, forbidden from stepping outside without a family member or reconnecting with Omar. Sahar, the younger sister, faced her own challenges. At 16, she was still adapting to life in Canada and was frustrated that her father insisted she wear a hijab, even though she aspired to embrace a Western lifestyle. At school, she would remove the hijab, let her hair loose, and put on makeup to blend in with the other teenagers. This subterfuge was soon discovered by her mother, who then took to personally escorting her children to and from school, ensuring she picked them up right after classes ended. Furthermore, she confronted a teacher for not monitoring the students closely enough. The Shafia siblings were forbidden from communicating with anyone outside the family or visiting friends. Battling depression, Sahar once attempted to poison herself by ingesting water mixed with silica gel. In a state of alarm, the sisters turned to their mother, Tuba, who reacted coldly, suggesting Sahar was destined for damnation. Subsequently, Sahar reached out to her teachers for support, disclosing that she was frequently subjected to physical punishment at home and surveilled by family members at school. She also revealed her attempt at suicide. The school principal, deeply troubled, contacted child social services. However, the intervention by the social worker dispatched to the Shafia residence failed to yield any positive outcomes. Confronted by an enraged father, Sahar was compelled to withdraw her allegations, leading to the discontinuation of the case without any further investigation. Life in the Shafia home remained unchanged. During this period, Rona occupied her time by strolling through parks and using public phones to communicate with relatives overseas. She eventually got in touch with a Virginia-based advocate for Afghan women's rights. Though they never met face to face, over the course of a year, Rona reached out to her as many as three times a week, expressing her desire for a divorce but fearing for her children's well-being. Her husband, dismissive and derogatory towards her, adamantly refused to release her and threatened harm if she attempted to leave. Moreover, Rona was in Canada under a repeatedly extended tourist visa. Exposure of the Shafia household's internal strife could potentially risk deportation for them all. The one aspect of life Muhammad failed to dominate 
was the advent of modern technology. A few months on, upon turning 19, Zainab was permitted to resume her education at a different school, attending morning sessions solo and evening French classes with either Hamid or her mother. Zainab hadn't forgotten Omar, and after a year of no contact, reached out to him via email, rekindling their clandestine meetings. Additionally, Zainab introduced Sahar to her classmate, Ricardo Sanchez, a 21-year-old recent Honduran immigrant. Occasionally, they went on double dates. Ricardo and Sahar cherished every moment together. Once, Ricardo observed bruises on Sahar's body, which she attributed to an accidental fall, never disclosing the household violence she endured. Thus, he was led to believe their relationship must remain hidden due to religious disparities. Besides Zainab, Ricardo was acquainted with another sister, Hidi, who at 13 was beginning to push back against familial expectations. Having never lived in Afghanistan and educated in a Dubai private school, Heidi showed little interest in her father's strict cultural practices, favoring instead makeup and trendy attire, much like her elder sisters. In protest against punitive measures, she frequently skipped classes. Despite her father's complaints to the school, Heidi's rebellious stance persisted. On a spring evening in April 2009, Heidi, along with her younger brother and sister, lingered too long at a mall, unwittingly becoming the targets of their father Muhammad's and brother Hamid's wrath in a severe outburst. Enraged, the duo verbally and physically assaulted the children, with Zainab looking on, powerless to shield her younger siblings. This incident prompted Zainab to make a drastic decision to flee her oppressive home environment. Despite seeking assistance from her boyfriend Omar and facing his initial reluctance, she was adamant about leaving, citing her inability to endure their circumstances any longer. The prospect of marriage between Omar and Zainab was bleak, given their parents' anticipated disapproval. Ultimately, Omar had no option but to help Zainab escape, despite his lack of resources. On April 17, 2009, the Shafia household was plunged into turmoil. Hamid alerted the authorities of his sister's disappearance. The revelation of Zainab's escape left the other children feeling anxious and fearful, compelling them to confide in a passerby their reluctance to return home. The responding officers uncovered the children's fears of their father and brother, learning of the physical abuse and threats they faced for any act of defiance. Upon the officers' arrival at the Shafia residence with the children, Muhammad's mere presence and a few words in their mother tongue were enough to silence and sway the children into retracting their statements. Rona, Muhammad's first wife, was the only adult in the home aware of the reality, but found herself in a powerless position. Treated as a subordinate by Tuba, deprived of her passport, and with restricted access to communication, Rona managed to maintain contact with her overseas family through the modest allowance she received. That evening, a social worker's visit to the Shafia home led to an interaction with Tuba, Muhammad, and Hamid. Despite recognizing potential evidence for a criminal investigation, the decision was left to the prosecutor, following protocol. No charges were filed, setting the stage for the Montreal police to later probe into a grave crime two and a half months afterward. Omar led Zainab to a shelter designed as a refuge for young women between 18 and 30 facing life challenges. The facility's staff were at a crossroads upon her arrival, given her unique circumstances. Yet, in this sanctuary, Zainab tasted the freedom she longed for, enjoying the autonomy to move freely. Omar served as the liaison between her and her family. When law enforcement took an interest due to the Shafia family's inquiries, Omar reassured them of Zainab's well-being and her voluntary decision to leave. An officer met Zainab at the shelter, heard her reasons for leaving, and subsequently communicated with her parents, emphasizing Zainab's autonomy and urging them to respect her wishes for separation. Despite the officer's caution, Tuba Shafia, through Omar, orchestrated a meeting with Zainab at a public venue near a souvenir store. Tuba, tearful and pleading, implored her daughter to return, offering a wedding with Omar as a compromise if Zainab's love was genuine. Influenced by Omar, 
who had been persuaded by Tuba's promises of protection against her authoritative husband, Zainab decided to return home, a decision that would ultimately prove to be misguided. On May 1, 2009, taking advantage of her father Muhammad's absence due to a business trip, Zainab re-entered the family home. The marriage, set for May 18, was marred by familial opposition and Tuba's attempts to thwart the union, given Omar's external cultural background. Meanwhile, Sahar and Ricardo considered escaping to Honduras, with Sahar desiring to bring her sister Heidi along, highlighting Heidi's fearless defiance against the patriarchal threats. The wedding, executed through a nika arranged by her uncle, took place as planned, despite final admonitions against it. The ceremony, marked by the absence of the groom's family and vacant seats, signified a profound dishonor to the Shafia's societal standing. Tuba's fainting at the event underlined the gravity of the disgrace. The marriage concluded abruptly at the restaurant, dissolved by mutual consent as Zainab succumbed to familial pressure, prioritizing her family's honor over her personal happiness. This decision, however, did not mitigate the fury within her family, particularly from Muhammad, nor did it alleviate Sahar's peril, as her secret relationship with Ricardo was dangerously close to being disclosed, leading to severe consequences. On June 1, 2009, Hamid journeyed to Dubai to reunite with his father, and on June 13, their aircraft touched down at Montreal Airport. Upon their reunion, Muhammad gently kissed Zainab's forehead and expressed forgiveness, though his sincerity was questionable. He desired his daughter to perceive harmony. To solidify this facade of goodwill, on June 23, around 3 p.m., the Shafia family embarked on a brief excursion. Hamid, his father, and the younger siblings traveled in the family's Lexus, while the women occupied a recently acquired pre-owned black Nissan. After enduring months of turmoil, a sense of calm finally enveloped them. The journey began strangely, with a direct route to Grand Ramu along the Gatineau River. Exploring nearby attractions, the family captured fleeting moments of happiness in photographs taken with their mobile phones. The girls and Rona found amusement and laughter in the hotel room, while Muhammad and Hamid took a stroll. If the men harbored any sinister motives, their plan evidently faltered. Following an overnight stay in a motel and a breakfast stop, the Shafia family resumed their journey southward towards Ottawa, forming a horseshoe-shaped route spanning 300 miles. Later investigations revealed their route through Sahar's phone records, as she remained engrossed in constant texting with her boyfriend. By the evening of June 25th, the entire family had reached Niagara Falls and settled into a hotel for a four-day stay, indulging in tourist attractions, fast food delights, and leisurely walks through the shopping center. On the night of June 27th, Hamid, the eldest brother, inexplicably drove back to Kingston, a five-hour journey. Tracking his phone's location, indicated his presence near the renowned city locks before returning to Niagara Falls. Departing the hotel on June 29th at 6.45 p.m., an unconventional hour considering the seven-hour drive ahead to Montreal, surveillance footage captured Hamid settling the room bills with cash. It wasn't until 8 p.m. that both vehicles departed from the highway, with Mohammed and Hamid occupying the front seats of the Lexus, while Tuba assumed the role of driver in the second car being the sole licensed woman among them. Traveling east towards Toronto, Sahar documented the vibrant city lights on her phone, sharing them with her boyfriend. After navigating through the city, the cars turned east onto Highway 401 en route to Kingston. Around 10.30 p.m., they made a pit stop at McDonald's. Fatigue led the women and children to doze off, prompting Muhammad to take over driving from Tuba. As they neared Kingston, all except Hamid and Mohammed slumbered peacefully. Ignoring major city exits, the men veered northward towards Kingston Mills Locks, arriving at 1.30 a.m. Sahar received her final text message from Ricardo at 1.36 a.m. Mohammed alighted from the Nissan, with Tuba taking the driver's seat as instructed, awaiting her husband and son's return after they sought out lodging. It was an odd location to wait having passed numerous signs indicating nearby hotels along the way. 
Around 2 a.m., the manager of the Kingston East Motel received an unexpected phone call for room bookings. Answering the call, the employee encountered two men, Mohammed and Hamid, at the door. Inquiring about the number of occupants, the men appeared unsettled. Initially stating six, they later suggested there might be nine, engaging in a brief discussion in an unfamiliar language amongst themselves. Eventually, they settled on six occupants. Hamid settled the bill in cash and escorted the three drowsy children to their room, after which he and his father departed in their SUV, veering left toward the locks, piquing the motel manager's curiosity. Deciding to wait and observe, the manager found it peculiar that two individuals would book a room for six in the wee hours and leave almost immediately. By 2.30 a.m., the guests had not returned, further fueling the manager's intrigue. Meanwhile, the black Nissan carrying four women descended slowly into the water. Among them were Rona, Muhammad's first wife, and his three elder daughters, Zainab, Sahar, and Gidi. This marked the method by which the male members of the Shafia family sought to cleanse their shame. Attempting to stage a car accident, the parents and eldest son, Hamid, encountered difficulties due to the challenging path the Nissan had to traverse. Negotiating a high curb, driving through grass, executing a sharp left turn to evade a rocky outcrop, and then turning right proved arduous. Even then, a concrete ledge obstructed the path to the water, halting the car's progress upon impact. With the engine running and hopes of the car plunging into the water dashed, the relatives resorted to pushing the Nissan into the water using the Lexus. The forceful collision resulted in the left headlight of the SUV shattering, scattering broken plastic on the ground. Retrieving the fragments in the darkness, the perpetrators calmly returned to the motel. The following morning, Kingston police confronted the grim task of identifying the victims and unraveling the events. Remarkably, despite the car being submerged only six feet deep, no attempts at escape were evident, with all seats reclined and seat belts unfastened. Several pieces of broken headlight plastic were discovered on the ground in front of the locks, offering scant clues. As the Kingston police grappled with the perplexing scene, a distress call reached the Montreal police from the Shafia residence, reporting the disappearance of their three daughters. According to Tuba's account, the girls had allegedly absconded with a vehicle while the family was checking into the motel for the night. Initially assuming they might have returned home, the relatives grew increasingly concerned when they failed to locate them. Earlier, at 7.30 a.m., Hamid placed a call to 911, claiming involvement in an accident where his car collided with a yellow barrier. The peculiar incident occurred in an empty parking lot, drawing suspicion despite Hamid's attempt to fabricate an alibi. As the police noted the Shafia's Lexus, with a damaged headlight matching the barrier's height. The tragic end to the family trip swiftly made headlines, evoking public sympathy for the grieving parents and their nanny who lost three children. Muhammad and Tuba assumed the roles of sorrowful parents, maintaining their narrative and participating in tearful interviews with journalists. However, public empathy waned quickly as listening devices planted in the vehicles unveiled the harrowing truth. In reality, Muhammad harbored intense anger towards his daughter's perceived defiance, particularly Zainab and Sahar's disregard for his directives regarding relationships. Believing that nothing surpassed family honor, Muhammad deemed his daughter's actions as a grave dishonor to the Shafia name, necessitating their demise, along with Giti, who idolized her sisters and would not have willingly been left behind. Rona, displaying suspicious behavior according to Muhammad, was included in this tragic fate. The police swiftly cracked the case within three weeks, aided by various contributing factors. Past reports to law enforcement, numerous grievances filed with Child Protective Services, Zainab's previous escape from home, and the revelation of Rona Shafia's true identity all played pivotal roles. Additionally, eyewitness testimonies of two cars at the locks during the night emerged. All victims exhibited head injuries, suggesting they were incapacitated before the car was submerged, clarifying their lack of attempts to escape. The absence of seatbelt usage and the women's inability to operate a vehicle, 
cast doubt on the car theft narrative. On July 21st, authorities executed a search warrant at the Shafia residence accompanied by social workers, resulting in the removal of the three youngest children for their safety. Inside, incriminating evidence against the Shafia family surfaced, including Hamid's laptop containing searches for maps of eastern Ontario, remote lakes and bodies of water, alongside peculiar inquiries such as, can property be managed from prison? Furthermore, Hamid's suitcase contained photographs of the sisters with their boyfriends, presumably a means for the boyfriends to inform Zainab and Sahar's father of their secrets. Subsequently, Tuba, Hamid, and Muhammad Shafia were apprehended and charged with the premeditated murder of four individuals. After 15 hours of deliberation, the jury sentenced all three to life imprisonment. Nevertheless, the tragic reality remains that this catastrophe could have been prevented. The turmoil brewing within the Shafia household was known to numerous teachers, relatives, and law enforcement personnel, yet no action was taken to intervene. Muhammad Shafia's twisted scheme to reclaim family honor succeeded simply because he viewed women as possessions, tragically depriving his own children of their lives. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon.